Welcome back, Deep Your View TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here from deepyearview.com, and I'm trying enunciation this time, so no more Christicles. And I think this week I'm going to call you guys Deepers. That's where we're going to go with. That's your name this week. Let us know what you think. And you know, what we're going to do today is something that you've asked for. On the forums, people are saying we want some instructional videos on videography, techniques, exposure, handling, log files, all that kind of stuff. So today we've got a fun and easy entry-level video. We're going to be talking about videographic exposure today. Now for today's video we're going to keep it simple so we're going to assume that we're not doing a raw recording or log recording yet just that you're starting out and using standard color profiles and if all that stuff that I just said makes no sense don't worry we're probably going to address that in future instructional videos for you. But what we're going to be talking about today is the four basic aspects of video exposure. So I know you guys are all familiar with your exposure triangle in photography so this is simply an exposure triangle with four aspects. That would be a square Chris. It's, we're gonna go with trapezoid. It's a trapezoid, an exposure trapezoid, because those are kind of triangular, but with an extra thing. All right, so I want to start off talking about aperture and how that plays a part in videography. You know, essentially depth of field is identical between photo and video, but you can use depth of field in very creative ways for video, like you just saw now, a person walking from out of focus to the plane of focus. Now, of course, very thin depth of field is a popular look in photography because it very much draws the viewer's eye to the focal point you want them to look at, and that does work in videography as well, but some of the challenges you're going to face with ultra thin depth of field are, for example, looking at somebody talking just like I am. If you're moving your hands a lot or bobbing your head in and out, you can very easily have that subject go in and out of focus. It can be quite distracting. So, you know, one thing that Jordan really recommends, even though you bought those really expensive wide aperture lenses, he often suggests stop down a bit. Give yourself a little bit of leeway so that you have that coverage just in case. In the end, though, it's all up to you how you want to use it creatively. And don't forget, you can manually focus and use that depth of field in a very interesting way to draw the eye visually through your frame. The last thing I want to touch on is f-stops versus t-stops. You're going to hear that quite a bit in the video world. Now we're not going to get too technical, but just remember that an f-stop value is part of a mathematical equation. It's your focal length of your lens divided by the actual diameter of the aperture blades in millimeters, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the exact amount of light coming through the lens. There's lots of other factors involved where you might lose some light transmission. What this all means is that if you buy a really fancy lens and it says it's an f 1.4, it might not actually give you 1.4 amount of light. You might be getting something more like 1.7 or 1.8. It really depends on the lens. So T-stops are very simply this. Rather than go with the f-stop value, the manufacturers actually figured out the true light transmission and they're giving you a T-stop to represent the actual light going through to the camera. Now in photography, f-stops aren't a big deal. Our cameras are often doing automatic exposure, so they compensate for this little issue here. Any sort of post-processing can take care of it from photo to photo to photo. We're talking about, you know, in most cases, a third stop. But in videography, this can be an issue. I mean, imagine if you're doing multi-cam work, for example, on a live show where you've got two different lenses at 2.8 and they're not giving you the exact same amount of light. That could be a problem. And even if you can fix it in post afterwards, if you've got a multi-day shoot, we're talking about a lot of work from scene to scene as you switch lenses. It's expensive, and this is why you might want to invest in T-stopped lenses. Hey everyone, it's Jordan to talk about shutter speed and this is definitely the exposure variable that photographers struggle with the most. Because in photography we're primarily using it to freeze action, but in video it determines the sense of motion in the shot. And let's just wave our hands around in front of our faces right now, especially if you're on public transit right now, and you can see we see a natural blur when we do that. Same thing that you're seeing in the video right now. That's because we're using a shutter speed that's double our frame rate. We're shooting 24 frames per second right now, we're shooting at a 48th of a second, and if your camera can go close, 50th of a second. But whatever frame rate you're shooting at, double your shutter speed will give you nice natural looking movement. Okay, so for a perfect demonstration of shutter speed, I'm bringing in my friend, local legend, Adam Mudry. Adam, no, you're supposed to come from, you know, we don't have time or enough fog, let's just, let's just do this.
So while Adam's playing right now, I've shot this at a 50th of a second, which is gonna give us natural looking movement, and a 500th of a second, which is a shutter speed I would use if I was photographing live music to freeze action. And you can see the 500th of a second looks really weird here. Where our 50th of a second, we're seeing some blur, we can actually see where the drumsticks are going. At a 500th, they just appear and disappear around the frame irregularly. Looks extremely weird, it's not how our eyes see motion. You look at things like horror movies, occasionally they'll use fast shutter speeds for effect because it's disorienting, but I don't want everything that I shoot to look like a horror movie. And it doesn't just apply to fast action. Here you can see Chris talking and I guess doing some judo or something, and you can see even with this slower movement, the fast shutter speed looks weird when we're looking at it right now. And that's why we want to try to stick to that double your frame rate rule. So what this really means is shutter speed is just going to be a fixed exposure setting for the vast majority of your shooting. If you really want to control light levels, generally you're going to be using your iris to do that. Uh, Jordan, it's an aperture. They're the same thing. Stop using your video speed. Iris or aperture to adjust exposure. If you're in lower light, you're also going to be using your gain to adjust exposure. Oh, that's more video lingo. Now I'm going to explain that later in the video. We'll get to that. Uh, or you can also use filters if you're in bright light. Again, we'll touch on all that stuff later. You know what? Chris can talk about something now I'm out all right deepers this is a quick and easy one I want to talk about ISO and essentially when it comes to photo and video ISO is identical same values same kind of light sensitivity but that being said I just want you to keep in mind Jordan just talked about how we often use relatively slow shutter speeds to do video as compared to photo and because of this you don't often have to crank your ISO that high also on top of that if you do need to raise it to get your depth of field where you need it by all means do it. But I find that in video, it's a little bit more forgiving because with the motion, the noise pattern's always changing. It's not as abrasive as in a photo. Last thing I wanna mention, because videographers think that they're cooler than the rest of us, they like to call ISO GAIN. It's an acronym, I believe it stands for Gangsters and Industry Ninjas because that's what they consider themselves. All right, so let's talk about the fourth leg of this exposure square. I'm calling it a square, Chris. It's a trapezoid and you know it. Regardless, right now we're shooting in a bright day. We're at our lowest sensitivity. We're at a 50th of a second, so I get nice natural motion blur. But you can see we've got this really distracting background. And Chris has already put a three-stop ND filter on it just to be able to shoot at 5.6. But I still don't love this background, so we're going to put some more ND on right now. So now we've got six stops of neutral density on there, so we're able to shoot at f2. And you can see we've knocked that background out more effectively. So I'm using my aperture choices creatively, and then I'm using neutral density when I'm in bright sun to control the exposure. That's why you really wanna have these in your bag. Now there's a couple types of neutral density filters. I like using these fixed ones because we can swap them over and out and there's no issues with reflection, anything like that. You'll also find variable neutral density filters, and these will let you smoothly move between different exposure gradients. The trouble with that is they're polarizers as well so you'll see weird things happening with your reflections when you change exposure and even when you pan the camera so I prefer working with fixed ones but it is certainly a bit less convenient so now Chris is shooting me with a neutral density filter and a polarizer and polarizers are great because you probably already have one in your gear bag they'll cut down on average two stops of light now right now Chris doesn't have the polarizing effect on but as he swings it over here you can see that the reflections in the water lessen also the exposure on my face shifts a little bit looks really great. The problem is if I'm using two angles, one with the polarizer, one without the polarizer, my saturation and exposure are going to shift between shots. So I love using pulls for video. Just don't mix and match shots with and without a polarizer. All right. I hope you enjoyed that useful little tutorial on the video exposure trapezoid. No, the video exposure square. It's a trapezoid. And uh, <laughs> you can you can solve that argument on the comments below. And don't forget, there's so much more we want to talk about in terms of video exposure and techniques, things like frame per second, things like log file, raw reporting. Camera movement, audio, yeah. lots of stuff that we want to touch on. Let us know what you guys would like to see in mm. the comments below. And also don't forget to check out our Twitter, our Instagram mm -hmm. feeds, and definitely subscribe if you want to see more content. Yeah, I mean, that's the way to show us that you want to get more of this content. Subscribe. That's how you show us love. Yeah, show us love. We're so insecure as all YouTubers are. We need the love. And of course, comment below anything else you want to talk about. We could do photography tutorials. Otherwise, in the meantime, if you're looking for some more information. Yeah, if you really found this useful, check out Richard Butler wrote an intro to video for photographers. You can see the link in the description below. Great article to get you started as well. But don't worry, more gear reviews coming soon, so stay tuned.